Three months later, on the 20th of November 2013, the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal reconvened its hearing. Today, the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal will sit and hear two cases. There are two charges for today. One is the case Kuala Lumpur Crime Commission against Amos Yavon. The other one is the Kuala Lumpur Crime Commission against the State of Right. I shall now read the first judge. The first judge is case number 3, C82013. That is Kuala Lumpur Crime Commission against Amos Yaron. The judge is as follows. It is against, it is for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. The defendant Amos Yaron perpetrated war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide in his capacity as the commanding Israel general who is in military control of Shatra, Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in Israeli occupied Lebanon in September 1982 when he knowingly facilitated and permitted the large scale massacre of the residents of those two camps in violation of the Hague Regulation on Land Warfare of 1907, in violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, in violation of 94, 1948 Genocide Convention, in violation of the Nuremberg Charter 1945, in violation of the Nuremberg Principle 1950, and in violation of the customary international law the law of war, the international military law, and the related provisions set forth in Article 9, 10, and 11 of the Charter of the Colombo War Crime Commission. And now for the second judge. For the crime of genocide and war crimes as followed, from 1948 and continuing to date, the State of Israel, hereafter defendant, carried out against the Palestinian people a series of acts namely killing, causing serious bodily harm and deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. The conduct of the defendant was carried out with the intention of destroying in whole or in part the Palestinian people. These acts were carried out as part of a manifest pattern of similar conduct against the Palestinian people. These acts were carried out by the defendant through the instrumentality of its representatives and agents, including those listed in Appendices 1 and 2. Such conduct constitutes the crime of genocide under international law, including the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide 1948, the Genocide Convention, in particular Article 2, and punishable under Article 3 of the State Convention. It also constitutes the crime of genocide as stipulated in Article 10 of the Charter of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission. Such conduct by the defendant as an occupying power also violates customary, customary international law as embodied in the Hague Convention of 1907 respecting the laws and customs of war on land and the Fort Geneva Convention of 1949. Such conduct also constitutes war crimes and crimes against humanity under international law. So if we and now I shall call upon the prosecution and after the defense to introduce themselves at you. Thank you. Honourable and esteemed members of the panel of judges, there have been four preliminary objections filed by the defence some time ago, and written submissions <coughs> were, we were directed to submit written submissions on all the four points. The defence, of course, has those who prefer those. Uh, Point, those uh, preliminary objections filed the us and we have responded to those. And we were directed that there will be a ruling in the 
respect of each of the preliminary objections this morning before the commencement of the trial proper. So we await your ruling now and your further direction on it. What I thought would be done this morning, if as it is, is the um, uh, submissions by the Council for the Constitutions on the preliminary objections, and then the only uh, after a recess, we deliver the ruling. Uh, please. Please. Um, the Defense have raised has raised four preliminary objections and they have been bounded in this copy um, titled Defense slash Amicus Curia Preliminary Objections 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, in brief, the four objections are as follows. The first one relates to the temporal jurisdiction of this tribunal. And we say that this tribunal does not have the temporal jurisdiction to hear cases that have or incidents that are contained within charges 3 and charges 4. The second objection is specifically for charge number four, in that we are asserting that there cannot be a charge proper against the state, the state of Israel. That charge is wrong. Preliminary objection number three relates to the charge, the form of the charge against the wrong. For duplicity, defectiveness and latent duplicity. Preliminary objection number four is for the same reason, duplicity, latent duplicity and defectiveness in the charge against the State of Israel, charge number four. Written submissions have been tendered and if this is the tribunal, I will briefly just run through it, make reference also to our bundle of authorities number four, which supports the preliminary objection number four. If I may turn to excellent attention to page one, page one of the written submission. The rules of this tribunal provide for a to have a lacuna provision in that if there is a lacuna in the rules of this tribunal, Reference can be made to rules of procedure and evidence of a similar based on existing international tribunal relating to what relating to international humanitarian law. So we have made comparisons with the rules of the International Court, International Criminal Court, the ICC, the ICPY, the ICPR. And the basis of the first objection against the temporal jurisdiction of this tribunal is one against retroactivity of the laws, against retroactive laws. The rules are silent for this tribunal. Article 7 of our charter states that the commission and tribunal shall have jurisdiction under this chapter in respect of the following crimes, crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide and war crimes. By analogy, the ICC will only hear cases for incidents that were that happened after the entry of the force of the Rose Statute. Now that date is the first of July 2002. By analogy, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY, will only hear cases for incidents that occurred from 1st of January 1991 onwards. Now, the references for this are Articles 20. Articles 11 and Articles 24, sub 1 of the Statute of Rome, which can be found at pages 691 and 698 of the first, our first bundle of authority. Reference is also made to Article 8 of the ICTY Statute, which can be found at page 22 of our, our bundle, volume 1. Oh, uh, the pages are 
for after the for the statute of rule, it's at pages, it's at bundle one, page six nine one and six nine eight, and six nine eight. That is for the statute of rule reference, and for the ICTY statute, that reference is at bundle number one, page twenty two. Jason, um, thank you for your arguments. Uh, I, I wish to clarify. I'm not so clear on your statement about retroactive laws. Uh, it seems to me you are giving a very broad interpretation to the prohibition against retrospectivity. My understanding of retrospectivity is that crimes cannot be created retrospectively. You cannot illegalize today what was legal yesterday and leave the law back to effect. Uh, or what if the action was illegal even at the time it was committed, but there was no court at that time. The court is created later and allowed to uh, try to have jurisdiction over matters committed earlier. So um, your statement that laws must not be retro retroactive is a little bit uh, too general, it appears to me. Judge Haruku, you have, you have gone to the heart of my point. May I, um, may I seek the court, uh, tribunal of indulgence to uh, move to page four of the submission at point number 11. It is merely an analogy that we are making that modern day tribunal such as the ICC, the ICTY, the ICTR, the SCSL, Special Court of Sierra Leone, and the ECCC, Extraordinary Chambers in the Court of Cambodia. Now, all of those modern day present tribunals, which deal with essentially the same types of acts as we are dealing with, they have a start date at the very least. Some have a start date and some have a date range. The, the ones with the start dates are the ICTY, ICTR, the ECCC, SASL. A definite range is for the ICTR and the ECCC. That means there's a start date and an end date of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. The start dates are often backwards in time. Yes, it is. It is it. Yes, it is. I will consider that. We contrast this with the earlier tribunals that have been formed for such cases, Nuremberg and Tokyo, are two that come to mind immediately. Now, if we read the charter, the, the charter of the Nuremberg and Tokyo, they, all, they, they are worded extremely generously, very generally, very organized. Of course, the maxim is that a person cannot and should not face a criminal prosecution for an action that was not criminal, as Judge Barbie has pointed out. There are arguments for and against this position, but this is the one point. There's only a simple point that we, 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 we hope that this tribunal takes into account for this point only. In present day tribunals or present day constituted courts, other than Nuremberg and the Tokyo Tribunal, there's only one other tribunal that we know of that has wordings that are open-ended as to temporal jurisdiction, and that is the military tribunal at Guantanamo. The exact wordings can be found at section 948D of the Military Commission Act 2006. That part can be found at paragraph number 14 at page 5 of my submissions. The exact wording that gives authority to that tribunal is a military commission under this chapter shall have the jurisdiction to try any offense made punishable by this chapter or the law of war when committed by an alien unlawful enemy combatant. Now, this is the important part. Before, on, or after September 11, 2001. This tribunal came into existence on the 6th of June, 
2008. The acts allegedly committed by, in charge by the accused, they must be wrong in charge number three, are described to have happened in the month of September 1982, before 2007. Well, the acts allegedly committed by the accused in charge number four, starting from 1980 up to the present date and continuing long before this tribunal came into existence. As a friend of this tribunal, Defense Amicus makes this point. This objection is really about the soul of this tribunal. Where do we go? What position do we take? Do we take that of Nuremberg, Tokyo, Guantanamo, on the one hand, or do we take a position of ICC, UI, NCPR, CSR, ECCC? That is, that is the essence of what they say. Your learning submission mentioned three tribunals uh, which have a cross section jurisdiction, uh, but you very adroitly uh, left out the Kuala Lumpur or Trans Tribunal. What does our chapter say? Look at Article 11. For the purpose of this chapter, war crimes mean grave breaches of the Geneva Convention of the 3rd August 1949. We have 49 there, but I, I believe I've made the point as that I say. May I move on to my uh, the short introduction, the short explanation of my second preliminary objection? The state of Israel cannot and or should not be made an accused in charge number four and Alternatively, if it can be made an accuse, the state of Israel enjoys immunity from prosecution for alleged offenses. From the wording of our charter and our rules, there shouldn't be a charge against the state, the state of Israel. Now, this tribunal is the judicial arm of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission. Objectives are similar to the Statute of Rome. For the ICC, RCPY, ICTR, those statutes are specific. They are only against natural persons. ECCC uses the term senior leader, which by definition, by definition would mean person, normal natural person. Article 2, sub 1, Romans 3 of our chapter specifically states the general objectives of the Commission are to bring war criminals of any nationality. To justice. Now, reading, giving a literal interpretation, to have a nationality implies it's a natural person. Our submission is that by using the word natural, nationality, our charter is in harmony with the statutes of the ICC, ICTY, ICTR, ECCC, in that it should only have jurisdictions over natural persons, not not nation states. This inference we submit can be made by reading how the word person or persons are used several times in our rules and our procedure, specifically at Article 2, 3, Article 4, Article 5, Article 11, and Article 12. And these are from the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. For Article 2, that's at page 30 of our Charter, the minimum standards of fair procedure and evidence shall comprise of the following. A. Every person against whom a position of charge is made shall be presumed innocent until his culpability is established on the evidence. His, as normal rules of statutory interpretation, can also denote male or female gender, but it completely is a natural person. In Article 3, at page 33 of the Charter, the word person is also used, shall state the offence, by which the charge shall state the offence with which the person is charged before the tribunal. Or, the offence must be positively and precisely stated so that a person charged may know with certainty of the charge offence. Article 5. I hope the point is continued. The charge against the state of Israel, we submit, is against the very charter of the tribunal. The second part of this 
objection, preliminary objection number two, is that Article 2, sub Article 1 of the chapter speaks of the general and specific objectives of the Commission. Now, this trial is called the Tribunal. By the Charter, there is no authority conferred on this Tribunal to hear any action against the government, the government of a country, for example, the government of Israel. Article 2, sub 1. Romans 2 of the Charter at page number 4 of the book. The general objectives of the Commission are to put an end to all war crimes and crimes against humanity currently perpetrated by any government in any part of the globe. It says government. It does not say nation state. The state of Israel is is different from the government of Israel. The third, the third part of this preliminary objection number two, international simply does not allow a nation state to be completed as an accused in a criminal tribunal. The state of Israel is a nation state. It is recognized by the United Nations. It was admitted as a member on the 11th of May 1949 as a nation state has rights under international law. By comparison to the first tribunal, Nuremberg, all 24 accused there were natural persons. The decision of the case of Jones against the Ministry of Interior Saudi Arabia, a House of Law decision, United Kingdom House of Law decision in 2006. The important paragraph is that paragraphs 29 and 31, if I may read it. I would respectfully agree with the Court of Appeal that Mr. Jones's claim against the Kingdom should be dismissed on the ground that of state immunity for the reasons given by Lord Justice Mans in paragraphs 10 to 27 of his closely reasoned leading judgment with which Lord Justice Neuberger and Lord Phillips agree. Paragraph 31. A state is not criminally responsible in international or English law and therefore cannot be directly impeded in criminal proceedings. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, on the 3rd of February 2012, also decided in the case of jurisdictional immunities of the state Germany against Italy, Greece, intervening. And at point 31 of my summary. First, judgments of the ICJ are always considered as pronouncements of what the most authoritative judicial body holds to be in international law on a, to be in international law on a given point having regard to the given set of circumstances. That is weight. Now the case concerned a claim by Italy against Germany for reparations for injuries. It's a cautious claim. We admit this by violations of international humanitarian law committed by the German Third Reich during World War II. Italy had constrained German state properties within the territory of Italy. Italy also allowed enforcement of decisions of Greek civil courts against Germany in Italian courts. Germany's contention was that Italy had failed to respect the jurisdictional immunity in Germany that, that Germany enjoyed under international law by allowing civil claims to be brought against it in Italian court. This decision did encompass the issue of the role of immunity of states in cases which involve crimes of humanity and breaches of international law in armed conflicts as a result of massacres committed by the Third Reich during World War II. That is at paragraph 52 of the judgment. The question that was before the ICJ in that case was whether or not in proceedings regarding claims for compensation arising out of those acts, the Italian courts were obliged to accord Germany immunity. It is not entirely on all fours to admit that with the issues before described now. But there are many portions.
portions of that judgment that can be of assistance to this tribunal on the issue of state immunity for crimes of genocide and war crimes, the two charges that are against the Pope, Iran, and the State of Israel. Now, the key paragraphs I have listed in paragraph 37a to X can be, that can be found in, in pages 11 to 13. I turn now to uh, paragraph 38 of my submission. At page 13, oftentimes in the ninth edition of this book, wrote that the practice of states over a long period has established that foreign states enjoy a degree of immunity from the jurisdiction of the courts of another state. Customary international law admits a general rule to which there are important exceptions that foreign states cannot be sued. The examples are given in paragraph 39 citing uh, the European Convention on State Immunity and the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act 1976, that is of the United States, and the State Immunity Act 1978, that is in uh, statute in the UK. Uh, Judge Sumbasota also had a fine in her book at the second edition at page 142. It is an established rule of international law that foreign states might sue in our local courts but could not be sued here unless they voluntarily submit to the jurisdiction of the local courts. Such submission can be done either on an ad hoc basis or generally under the terms of the treaty. And this is not a local court, I agree. I believe I, I'll make that point right now. The State of Israel has not entered proceedings. We appear as defense amicus. Uh, we have not received instruction. By not entering appearance, the State of Israel, by inference, has not submitted to the jurisdiction of this tribunal. One more point. There are 32 countries currently in the world that do not recognize the State of Israel. Malaysia is one of them. If charge number four stands and this tribunal hears the prosecution's case against the State of Israel. By implication, this tribunal sitting in Malaysia recognizes the State of Israel. Thank you, Excellencies. I see the podium to my mentally for preliminary objections number three and number four. May it please this honorable court. I understand that written submissions were delivered um, to the Secretariat some time ago and I am just um, curious as to whether your honours have had the opportunity to review those submissions because if you have, my submissions would be much briefer. Um, so I take it that most of the court have actually. Um, the starting point um, is of course, as always, the powers and, and uh, jurisdiction of this honourable tribunal. And I would take your honours to the KLWCC Charter, in particular Article 2, subsection C. Every person must every person charged must be informed of the exact charges against him or her, which must be expressed clearly and exactly and supported by sufficient and relevant grounds and facts. Subsequently, the Charter in Article 2K indicates that where there is a, a lacuna in the Charter, then the Tribunal shall adopt the rules which comply with international standards of fairness and justice. Now, when it uses the word shall, that is permissive language, it's not mandatory language such as use of the word must. So the Tribunal is not required necessarily to adopt those principles but is indicative of an indication that the Charter should um, guide the Tribunal towards those principles. At Article um, Articles 3, 4 and 5 of Chapter 2 of Part 2 of the Charter, it is clearly stated at Article 4, the offence must be positively and precisely stated so that the person charged may know with certainty the charged offence. And it's 
very important, those few words, because what we have in the State of Israel and the Iran charges are essentially cumulative charges. Now, whilst cumulative charges are permissible at international law, they are not desirable. And they are not desirable because they do not necessarily provide for the principles of fairness and justice and clarity and efficiency. Some will say that the principles that we seek this tribunal to adopt are national criminal principles and therefore do not apply in the international sphere. We would reject such a contention and there is in fact judicial support for that in the case of the prosecutor against Norman, Fofana and Condua. That is the Special Court for Sierra Leone, case number SCSL-04-14-J at pages C3 to 14 C4. You will find a small extract of that case um, midway through uh, towards the end of tab C of this particular volume. It doesn't have a traditional um, uh, heading because that is the way that the um, Sierra Leone website has actually produced that particular document. I refer in particular and, and read this passage. As a matter of principle, international criminal tribunals should not resolve on their sacred responsibility in dispensing even-handed justice of acknowledging and applying recognised defences to criminal liability in municipal law systems. And by that I take it that the court is referring to domestic criminal law principles. To this effect, I can do no better than to adopt the observation of one learned author, McCulloch de Guzman M. in the commentary on the Rome Statute, in developing the international criminal law relating to defences, it is essential that the court be permitted to draw on principles of criminal law derived from national legal systems, which therefore enhances the court's ability to fill the lacunae in the international law. And it's interesting that they also use the word lacunae, because that reflects very strongly with Article 2C of the Kuala Lumpur Tribunal Charter, where we heard that in the event of a lacuna, principles should be drawn which comply with international standards of fairness and justice. So what is the problem with these two particular charges? They are drafted as cumulative charges. And where cumulative charges are permissible is where there is one charge heading and those things which flow under that charge heading are cumulative. So it would be, for example, to charge a war crime and have possibly several different versions of what that war crime was. That is a cumulative charge which is permissible. But if we look at the language of the charges in this particular matter, you will see that the charge against Iran, for example, is identified as three different types of criminal conduct. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And it proceeds to cumulatively charge all of those three separate offences together. And that is not a permissible cumulative charge of international law. We would su submit to this honourable tribunal that this creates a difficulty for this tribunal when it hears the evidence. This tribunal will need to consider each one of those charges, each one of the elements that must be proved to make those charges. And unfortunately, the way this charge has been cumulatively bundled together means that your honours are going to have great difficulty, as in fact we have had, trying to respond to which part relates to which charge. Which bit of evidence will go to which element? This would be so much easier if they had separated war crimes. These are the particular types of war crimes we allege. This is the evidence that will be led in respect of that. This is the crimes against humanity, the particular crimes against humanity, and the evidence which we led against that. We could see then how the evidence would attach to the elements which must be proved by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt. The charges are also defective because it's a fundamental rule of pleading those charges 
that the indictment must identify each of the essential factual ingredients of the offence charged. That requirement includes any legal prerequisites to the application of the offence in the circumstances of the particular case. Such a rule is not a mere technicality. Compliance with it is essential to enable the accused to know the nature of the case against him or her. That is a quote from the prosecutor against Badanen and Tadic. Decision on objections by Tadic to the form of the amended indictment on the 20th of February 2001. That particular decision was followed by another, was followed in the same case by a decision on the 26th of June, where it was also stated that the right of the prosecution to lead evidence in relation to facts not pleaded in the indictment is not as unlimited as its response to this complaint may suggest. There is an entitlement that the accused to be informed promptly and in detail of the nature and cause of the charge against them. For example, it would not be possible simply because the accused was not alleged to be directly involved, and that will become very important later on in this event, to lead evidence of a completely new offence which has not been charged in the indictment without first amending the indictment to include the charge. Where, however, the offence charged, such as persecution and other crimes against humanity, almost always depends on proof of a number of crimes, such as murder, the prosecution is not required to lay a separate charge in respect of each murder. What this tells us is that it's not duplicitous in a war crime against humanity or a crime against humanity to charge several murders. That's not duplicitous because it is forming part of the whole context of a particular crime, which is crimes against humanity. So it is different from the domestic uh, duplicity, we would submit. But nevertheless, in this particular instance, that cumulative charging has gone beyond that, as we have already submitted. The other aspects of which, which, which show um, from the case of Badan and, and Talic, what is difficult with these particular charges is that even in that case in Badan and Talic, the counts were separated clearly into the following offences. Genocide and complicity in genocide. Persecution as a crime against humanity. Extermination as a crime against humanity. Torture as a crime against humanity. So even within that particular case, they had counts which attached to particular types of criminal conduct. In this particular case, we don't have counts. We have one charge. One charge which charges genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And we would submit, again, that goes beyond what is permissible with cumulative charging. In, in fact, I would, I would submit that it comes down to one sentence, one simple proposition. When in doubt, charge separate counts to ensure fairness. But these principles are consistent in the Malaysian Criminal Code. This is not an unfamiliar principle to this tribunal. You would all have experienced it in your practice at some point. All of these defective aspects, which I have generally um, uh, addressed you on orally today, and, and particularly in writing, are ultimately separated into a table which is at the end of the written submissions. This table goes through the particular problems that each aspect of the two charges encounters. There is regularly no identification within each of the factual assertions as to which of the three generic offences are applicable. If we go to the charge of Yaron, for example, in paragraph 8, Your Honours will see that that paragraph is a short paragraph, and it attributes knowledge to Yaron that phalangists were likely to attempt to perpetrate massacres and other atrocities against the civilian population of Sabra and Shafira. It's a very, very large statement, even though it's very short. Does it deal with a war crime? Does it deal with some form of genocide? Does it deal with a crime against humanity? Which one is it out of those three that we saw were collectively charged at the beginning? We are not the ones who need to determine that. 
this tribunal is not or should not be placed in the position where it has to determine that. It is the task and role of the prosecution to separate those into the respective charges that it says is supported by those statements. The table that I did goes through collectively, I won't go through each one of these examples, it does it for both charges against Israel and Iran, but if you want to have an opportunity to review those, you will see that it is inherent throughout all of them. Problems arise everywhere. It's impossible to know which facts are attaching to which charge and which facts are attaching to which elements of those charges. And in terms of responding to this honourable court and attempting to clarify the position, the defence is placed in an unenviable position. And that places this honourable tribunal in an even more unfair position because it is not the task of the tribunal to work out what the charges should be. Those are my submissions from so, make peace, Your Honours. <coughs> I will deal with the first two preliminary objections. And uh, Francis Abdulaziz will deal with the third and fourth preliminary objections. Now, the first objection that is raised, and I have for reference the bundle which says prosecution. Preliminary objections is a thin, slim bundle, and I'm referring to tab A, which sets out in writing our submissions. So the first is temporal scope. What is suggested is that you cannot charge, you cannot refer the charges in respect of, you cannot have retrospective charges. So that is the allegation that is being made. Because we refer, for example, the genocide charge against the state of Israel to a time from 1945. Uh, the KL war crimes charter is from 2007. So what is suggested is we are creating uh, an offense which never existed before and we cannot do that. That violates, they say, the principle of retroactivity with respect. We say first is that always jurisdiction is founded on the basis of the charter that sets it up. That's the first point. So we must necessarily look at our charter. What does our charter say? Does it or does it not run jurisdiction to deal with offenses that took place, crimes that took place earlier in point of time? So if we look and this is set up very clearly that part one, article one says that the charter of the Care War Crimes Commission jurisdiction of the tribunal shall be governed by the provisions of this charter. And this charter does not set any temporal limit. It's exactly the same as the Nuremberg charter. There also they did not set a temporal limit. And there, as we know, the war was over. Nazi Germany was defeated, and then only the proceedings started thereafter on the basis of the charter that was established in respect of crimes that were committed during the Second World War, prior in point of time. So it's exactly the same. There is no statement in our charter that limits the jurisdiction to something that happens after 2007 when this chapter was. My learned friend has cited various uh, charters, various uh, laws that have been set up to deal with specific tribunals. So let's look at it. Let's look at their own bundle. Preliminary objects, headed preliminary objections by defense amicus. And I respectfully invite your attention to page three. They cite the International Criminal Court. Now, what does the International Criminal Court say? This is at page three. It says, the ICC will only hear cases concern, con concerning conduct committed after the entry into force of the Statute of Rome. That is 1st July 2002. So they say very clearly, you must 
you cannot, you have to consider conduct after this phase. So it is very clearly limited. Then we look at what they cite, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and this is their own presentation. The ICTY, which is known with only here cases concerning conduct occurring from 1st January 1991 onwards. International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, with which I understand one of your honours has more than a passing interest. There it says the ICTR will only hear cases conducted, uh, concerning conduct committed between January 1994 31st December 1994. And then the Cambodia says between 17 April 75, 6 January 79, and Sierra Leone says 31st. So the short, in short, the, the statutes that have been cited have absolutely no relevance to this position that they are taking, that you have no jurisdiction. And to put the matter beyond doubt, if you look at our charter, you will see that we are required by part 1, article 1, to investigate war crimes committed in Iraq, Palestine, Afghanistan, Lebanon. Committed. Already taken place. Just like you remember, in respect of war crimes committed by Nazi Germany during the war, before the charter was set up. Then, of course, the point that was raised by your Honour Judge Chad Faruqi, that was this did the Charter create a law that never existed, a law of genocide that never existed and it created for the first time so that when the State of Israel committed this, they did not realize, so they, they thought there is no such offense. And so now they are taken by surprise because they said, God, you know, how can you make something a crime which never was a crime before? But the point that we make, and it's confirmed by statutes, is that genocide has always been a crime. Everybody knows that, and everybody knows that there are obligations not to commit genocide, not to destroy, kill, maim whole population on grounds of their ethnicity, race, etc. And if we all we got to know, got to do is look at the genocide convention itself. It says Contracting parties confirm that genocide is a crime under international law. That's 1948. So even in 1948, even before the Genocide Convention came in, it was already a crime. And contracting parties, mean, which means the world community, which drew up this Genocide Convention in 1948, recognized this fact. So they always considered it a crime. And Israel is a party to the convention. It signed this on the 17th of August 1949. They know it's a crime. They're not taken by surprise. They have obligations. They ratified it on the 9th of March 1950. Finally, the point is that the crimes committed are also crimes under international law, regardless of the Genocide Convention, confirmed by statutes, treaties, customary international law. Just programs, the laws of wars, international humanitarian law. And these are all set out under Articles 9 to 11 of the Kuala War War Crimes Charter. And these treaties that I talked about, statutory treaties, are dated from 1907, 1945, 1946, 1948, 49, 50. So these are long-standing extant existing international law. So the principle of free proactivity has absolutely the respect, no application. That deals with the first aspect of the temporal scope. But then they argue, <coughs> you know, further they argue, that fine, but you see there was no tribunal. This tribunal only came to existence in 2007. There was no tribunal. So how can then you lay a charge in respect of a period of time before the tribunal came to existence. That is the argument. No tribunal, therefore, you have no jurisdiction to hear this case because we are dealing with offences before 2007, facts alleged 
before 2007. You only came into existence in 2007. The first point I want to make is to look at the practice of this court itself. This court has already tried in two zip, but we have, we have had already two cases tried here, and judgments have been delivered by this honorable tribunal. The first was against George Bush and Anthony Blair for crimes of aggression, crimes against peace, and this was in respect of crimes committed in 2003, four years before this tribunal came into existence. We had the verdict of the care of war crimes tribunal on another charge against Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld and their lawyers for the crime of torture, primarily. That was committed in 2001. That was six years before the tribunal came into existence. So we have very clear basis upon which we have acted. And we were not wrong at that time. We were entirely correct in doing so because international war crimes <coughs> jurisprudence reinforces the view the fact that there is no private tribunal set up to resolve a dispute does not mean that therefore you have no obligations in international law in respect of crimes that are recognized by international law. So the obligations always exist. I can refer in support to, and I have it at my page 2 submission at paragraph 8, the case of application of the convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. Oh, the report is at 2007, it's in my bundle, but I quoted the relevant part, so there will be no need to refer to that at this point of time. It's known as the Bosnia and Herzegovina against Serbia and Montenegro case. And I quote from page 100 and paragraph 148. I read, as it has in other cases, the court, that means that particular tribunal, the court recalls the fundamental dis distinction between the existence and binding force of obligations arising under international law and the existence of a court or tribunal with jurisdiction to resolve disputes about compliance with these obligations. The fact that there is not such a court or tribunal does not mean that the obligation does not exist. They retain their validity, they retain their legal force. States are required to fulfill their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law, and they remain responsible for acts which are attributable to them. The jurisdiction of the court is founded on Article 9 of the Convention, but it does not follow that the Convention stands alone. In order to determine whether the respondent breached its obligation, and if breach was committed to determine its consequences, the court will have recourse not only to the Convention, but also to the rules of general international law on treaty interpretation and on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. So this very clearly, in our respectful submission, refutes the argument that has been put forward that because you were constituted after these alleged acts, of constitute the crime of genocide against the two accused persons, this tribunal has no jurisdiction. In any event, we conclude by saying that there is clear authority that evidence that predates events may also be relied upon as evidence. For example, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda talked about evidence of acts that occurred prior to 1994. And they said this, this, the evidence of acts that occurred prior may be relied upon as evidence of a conspiracy that culminated on the genocide committed during the period between January 1994 and 31st December 1994. And so in our case, because we are talking about a series, a pattern of genocidal acts, as we allege, committed prior even to the setting up of the State of Israel in 1945, and we will bring experts from 1945 and continuing to the present day. So that deals with the first point as to whether you have jurisdiction or not. <clears throat> the second preliminary objection that is raised is that you cannot charge the state of Israel. The first argument that is, the first aspect of that argument they say is because if you look carefully, it only talks about persons. And so persons means 
some specific individuals or more than one of them, but it's not the state. I will deal with this aspect of the argument. If you look at the charter of the care of war crimes tribunal, it states its objectives as, among others, the two key ones that are relevant in this case, is <coughs> this Article 2.1, 3, Roman 2 and Roman 4. The charter, the objectives is to put an end to all war crimes to prevent the recurrence of war crimes. So war crimes is referred to as generically. Now this would require, in our respectful submission, that everybody, including persons within the jurisdiction of the nation-states, as well as nation-state itself, cannot commit the crime. They may be charged if they do so. Now, a similar argument, in fact, was raised under the Genocide Convention, so it's directly opposite. This was again in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I've cited the particular document, and I read, the article does not express its purpose, in other words, does not expressly state, requires states to refrain from themselves committing genocide. However, in the view of the court, taking into account the established purpose of the convention, the effect of Article 1 is to prohibit states from themselves committing genocide. So it's directly on point, because here, our charter also says you have to prevent this war crime. You have to put an end to this war crime. So the purpose. Such a provision follows on two bases. First, from the fact that the article categorizes genocide as a crime under international law. By agreeing to such a categorization, the state parties must logically be undertaking not to commit the crime so described. Secondly, it follows from the expressly stated obligation to prevent the commission of genocide. It would be, paradox it would be paradoxical if states were thus under an obligation to prevent, so far as within their power, commission of genocide by persons who, over whom they have a certain influence but were not forbidden to commit such acts through their own agents or persons over whom they have such firm control that their conduct is attributable to the state concerned under international law. <coughs> In short, the obligation to prevent genocide necessarily implies the prohibition of the commission of genocide. And the court went on to hold that although several provisions in the Genocide Convention emphasize the responsibility of individuals, the Genocide Convention also talks about responsibility of individuals, also talks about punishment of individuals, quote, that international law imposes duties and liabilities upon individuals as well as upon states. And this has long been recognized and decided the famous Nuremberg judgment. At paragraph 13 of the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the court says, the court observes that that duality of responsibilities, two responsibilities, right, that duality of responsibility continues to be a constant feature of international law, which is reflected in Article 25, Paragraph 4 of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. And then to address this particular point about the fact that this is not specifically mentioned, at Para 174, and I refer, Your Honours, to my page 4, at Para 174, the court says, <coughs> the court sees nothing in the wording or the structure of the provisions of the convention relating to individual criminal liability, which would displace the meaning of Article 1, read with paragraphs Article 3, A to E, so far as these provisions impose obligations on states distinct from the obligations which the convention requires them to place on individuals. Furthermore, the fact that Article 5, 6 and 7 focus on individuals cannot itself establish that the contracting parties may not be subject to obligations not to commit genocide and the other acts enumerated in Article 3. And the court concluded in these words, thus if an organ of the state or a person or group whose acts are legally attributable 
to the state commits any of the acts prescribed by Article 3 of the Convention, the international responsibility of the state is incurred. So, I have in my paragraph 13, I won't repeat it. I will say that, I will conclude by saying that if you look at the various provisions and apply them, and the case law that I've cited, it's very clear that the state itself, just because the word persons is used in the charter, in the genocide convention, the obligation extends to the state itself. And then it has also been suggested in the defense preliminary objection that the tribunal itself, it is not stated anywhere, that the tribunal itself, at the Akara 29, there is no authority conferred on this tribunal to hear any action. And we say that the tribunal is the judicial arm of the commission. Its recommendations are acted upon by the prosecutor, so that the two-tier process, there is a commission, the commission hears, filters, is a filtering process. If there is a basis, then it recommends, makes recommendations. On the basis of that, the prosecution then levies charges. So whatever jurisdiction is bestowed upon the commission is naturally flows onto and clothes the tribunal also with that same jurisdiction to prefer those charges based on the recommendation. So the, the commission has recommended that the state of Israel be charged for the genocide, for the crime of genocide. Now the other argument that was raised, the second aspect of this argument that you cannot charge Israel is that the word is government. It says Article 2.1 uses the word government, not state or nation state. And Israel is a nation state. And therefore you cannot charge Israel, you can only charge the government of Israel. I mean, you'd be quite happy to charge the government of the state of Israel and in passing. But just on this question itself, the point is, logically, when you refer to government, is logically extends and must mean the governing authority of a state. Government is nothing more than a governing authority for the state. The state does not exist in a vacuum. It does not function on its own. So, its act of the government must necessarily be attributed to a state. It is an organ of the state. So here we are referring to the genocide charge activities. We are referring to the official or governmental character of the acts which are attributable to the state of Israel. Quoting their own case, he quoted Jones case. The court refers, I just quote what the court says. The very official or governmental character of the acts and which still operates as a part of civil jurisdiction was now to be the essential element which made the acts an international crime. Now this is in fact reference to the torture convention and supports the convention that governmental acts are acts of state. So when you talk about government, we are talking about the state. So the second argument that is raised in this respect must be with respect rejected. Then the third and final argument on this point is international law does not allow the state of Israel to be impeded as an ex as an accused. And that the charter of the Nuremberg trial, all were persons, not states. And then they go on to say that the state enjoys immunity from being charged. The Nuremberg judgment states, it does not state that you cannot charge states. This is what it says, that international law, I quote, International law imposes duties and liabilities upon individuals as well as upon states, has long been recognized. So, their contention with respect that the charge against a state is not envisaged by the Nuremberg trial, it flies in the face of what the judgment itself says. In that case, of course, they brought 20 odd people before the court, and there the defense was different. There the defense was that. It is the state that is responsible. All these people, the lawyers, the judges, and others who carried out the dictates of the Nazi party, you cannot charge them because they're just carrying out orders, they're just functionaries. So there they had to deal with the person of the individual. But this makes it very clear. Duties and liabilities upon individuals as well as upon states. Then they raise the fact they cite Jones and Ministry of Interior Saudi Arabia, and they quote, 
a state is not criminally responsible in international law and therefore cannot be directly implicated in criminal proceedings. This is exactly the argument that was raised in the Bosnia Herzegovina case. The court answered the applicant accepts that general international law does not recognize the criminal responsibility of states. It contends on the specific issue that the obligation for which the respondent may be held responsible in the event of breach in proceedings under Article 90 is simply an obligation arising under international law, in this case the provisions of the Convention. The court observes that the obligations in question in this case arising from the terms of the Convention and the responsibilities of the state that would arise from breach of such obligations are obligations and responsibilities under international law. They are not of a criminal nature. This argument accordingly can be accepted. Then there is the case of Germany and Italy, but we wish to add that the case of Germany and Italy, although it related to compensation arising out of matters that arose during the Second World War, the armed conflict waged by, by Germany, these were matters that were raised in the domestic court and were civil ways. And I quote here, the court is not called upon to decide whether these acts were illegal. The court the question for the court is whether or not, in proceedings regarding claims for compensation arising out of those acts, the Italian courts were obliged to accord Germany immunity. So really it involved the question of whether one court, the role of domestic court of one state, to make decisions against another state. So these are the two clear distinguishing factors. One is the civil claim, another is that you cannot have one court in in the state to make decisions against another state. So, for example, you cannot have, in respect of a civil claim arising here, a local court making a judgment against the United States, for example, in respect of civil claim, they enjoy immunity. So, the Jones case makes it clear that when you talk about immunity, you're talking about, about immunity in civil claims. And if you look at the judgment, of Lord Bingham says the rule of international law is not that a state should not exercise over another state the jurisdiction which it has, but that, say in cases recognized by international law, a state has no jurisdiction over another state. Goes on to say, the majority, however, held that the grant of sovereign immunity to a state in civil proceedings, assumed the legitimate aim of complying with international law to promote comity and good relations between states through the respect of another state's sovereignty. So if a state should not have a jurisdiction over another state in civil claims, immunity is granted. That is recognized. In this case, that they cite makes that very clear. And there are qualifiers. It says, say in cases recognized by international law, and we have already seen genocide is a case recognized by international law as a war crime. And then it goes on to say, but the case was categorically different from the present case since it concerned criminal proceedings falling squarely within the universal criminal jurisdiction mandated by the Torture Convention and does not and did not fall within part one of the 17th Act. The essential ratio of the decision was that international law could not without absurdity require criminal jurisdiction to be assumed and exercised when the Torture Convention conditions were satisfied and at the same time require immunity to be granted to those properly charged. The Torture Convention was the mainspring of the decision and certain members of the House expressly accepted that the grant of immunity in civil proceedings was unaffected. So it's very clear that we are talking about civil proceedings, we're not talking about criminal proceedings. Because, as the court says, the former head of the House of Lords of England, Tom Bingham, has said it be absurd to grant, to say torture convention applies and applies to everybody, genocide convention applies, applies to everybody, and then to say that the moment the person is charged, then he is granted immunity. And we are talking about international war crimes that are going to be adjudicated at the international tribunal level. Final conclusion, therefore, is, as the court said, accordingly, having heard the various arguments, the court affirms that the contracting parties are bound by the obligations under the Convention not to commit through their organs or persons or groups whose conduct is attributable to them, genocide, and the other acts enumerated in Article 3. Thus, if an organ of the state or a person or group whose acts are legally attributable to the state commits any of the acts prescribed by Article 3 of the Convention, the international responsibility of that state is incurred. 
One final point was made, which is not in their written uh, uh, submission, is that if we allow Israel to be charged, then it implies that uh, Malaysia is recognizing Israel and Malaysia does not recognize Israel. With due respect, this is an international tribunal. It is geographically sitting in Malaysia. It can also, under the Charter, sit in various other jurisdictions. The Charter is very clear. So it has nothing to do with state policy. The fact that the Rwanda tribunal sat in a particular place and the former Yugoslavia tribunal sat in a particular place is not decisive of the issue. With respect, this argument cannot be sustained. I thank the honours. Before you sit down with the permission of uh, Mr. President, can I request you and perhaps Jason to address us on chapter 3, article 6b, page, page. That's page 34 of this. Uh, I hope you have the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, it makes it very clear. Okay. If the charge involves a sovereign state, I'm uh, grateful. If the charge involves a sovereign state, a current head of state government or a former, then we can serve and indeed we have applied this service to make them. This puts it beyond the adventure as to the fact that the argument cannot be accepted. Thank you, Your Honor. Defense has filed two applications. This two applications came just very recently. I understand that this case, we have already had a trial in this case. And there were no, there were no application of this nature in the first trial. When they agreed to, we would proceed with the trial. It must be a second talk or after talk. So on that ground alone, I think the application of objection should be dismissed. In any case. I shall proceed to respond to some of the points raised. Their application suggests that the charge is defective for duplicity. This one. Two, the charge is defective for uncertainty. Three, the charge is an abuse of process and or oppression. What I'd like to clarify right from the beginning, that I think they have misconstrued the charge. This charge is against a general who actually had committed which of his duties for facilitating and allowing crime, international crime, to be committed. It is not a case of Mr. A murdering Mr. B at a certain time of the day and a certain place. It's not that, not that kind of crime. They, they wanted us to be specific, time, date, and so on, of the commission of time. But you can't do it if you're dealing with one murder. Here is a case of a general facilitation, allowing the commission of crimes. He himself didn't murder anybody. It is a case of large-scale massacre. The number of people murdered between 300 to 3,000. It happened in three days or so. So I say that we stand by our written submission here to review all those allegations made by the defense. Because as far as but we are concerned. I can say that the charge is not effective for 
duplicity. Where is the duplicity? He's charged for failing to do his job. To control so that they can you could stop the massacre. So it's very clear there's no duplicity. All those offenses committed by those other people during that three days. And many have died, many were tortured. Many suffered injuries and so on. You don't need to go and specify the specific of all those. So this, the charge is about failure to do his duty. So there's no question of the And there is no question of uncertainty. Where is the uncertainty? And here I must say, the charge even elaborates the particulars of the charge. All in detail. It's very clear, there's no certain uncertainty about it. Then, the next one they say, the charge is an abuse of process. I don't think there is a shred of evidence that the person has been abused. They follow the proper procedure in accordance with the, with the law. There is no abuse at all. There is no oppression here. What we are asking is a fair, transparent trial. And this I think you have followed all the procedures and so on. So I, and I want to be brief. I submit that the arguments are without merit, and I pray that the objections be dismissed. Thank you, Your Honour. if we may reply, I will. I have four short points, and my colleague, my friend, my colleague will take the rest of it. The prosecution, the first point, the prosecution may have misconstrued the difference between the state and the government. Our objection is that the state cannot be completed in a tribunal of this nature. The government of the state is elected by the people. The government changes, the state does not change. Therefore, as with the first trial that was handled by this tribunal, George W. Bush, the head of the government of America, was charged for crime war, crimes against peace. Tony Blair, the head of the government of the United Kingdom, was charged for crimes against peace. The state, the United States of America, nor the United Kingdom, they were not charged. In the second trial that was before this court, eight natural persons were charged George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and the rest. They were natural persons. The state, the United States of America, was not charged. This trial now brings a different level. This, the first the charge against Iran, yes, he's a natural person, no issues there. But the charge against the state of Israel is wrong in law. If the charge had been against the head of the government of Israel at the times where the incidents that were enumerated in charge number four, all the incidents that were enumerated from 1945 until the present day, if each head of head of government, the prime minister, at that time, were charged, that would be all right. But 
the charge against the state of Israel is wrong. That's the first point. The second point. Uh, it was just disturbed. Yes. Uh, whatever activities uh, are taken by a government or a state or a group of people uh, forming a state uh, without the participation and involvement of uh, uh, human beings, uh, nothing could have happened. Yes. Yeah, right? There must be some human being, not just robot or machinery. Uh, that, that's all I wanted to tell you on that. I, I totally agree. Had the charge number four been framed against uh, the, the heads of the, the heads of states, the, the prime minister of uh, the success, the different prime ministers of Israel of the state of Israel had the prime ministers of each of them were, were to be uh, indicted in charge for that would not be a problem. But because the state of Israel as a whole has been indicted, then that is a problem. We we can be select. If I may uh, go to my second point. Second point is this. Um, I, I believe my learned friend, um, the learned prosecution, may have misconstrued how submission was that if this tribunal allows charge number four against the state of Israel to stand, this tribunal, not the government of Malaysia, this tribunal would impliedly recognize the validity of the state of Israel. The existence of the state of Israel. This tribunal, we're not saying anything about the government of Malaysia or the state of Malaysia. Point number three. I refer to the excellent points brought up by Judge Haruki at page 34 of our chapter. Now, page 34 is in chapter 3, Service of Charge and Trial Dates. It reads, if the charge involves a sovereign state, the current head of state government, former head of state or government service of a hate crime. This is the procedural and evidentiary uh, part. It is not the chapter per se, it is the rules of it falls under the rules of part two, the rules of procedure and evidence of the tribunal. These are the rules. Yeah. It cannot, the rules cannot go against entrenched principles of law. It may say it involves a sovereign state, and if we take a very if we take a, a, a different reading of it, if it involves a sovereign state, well, we can say that, of course, charge 3 against Amos Yaron involves sovereign state of Israel because Yaron was a general, uh, a general serving in the state of Israel at the time. So it involves the state of Israel. We can take that reading, and this portion would harmonize with the position taken by the amicus in preliminary objection number 2. So, and this one line cannot go against the French principles of law. If I may go to my final point, point number four. These four preliminary objections were not enough at all. Far from it. Preliminary objections number one and number two were before the tribunal before it sat in August. With, with the respect that's the correct and the argument that was made, uh, by country uh, was that the third and fourth charge was an afterthought, not the first and second. Thank you. The third and charge, the third and fourth preliminary objections were not an afterthought because the tribunal when it sat, the panel when it sat in August, did not go beyond the reading of the two charges when it adjourned the trial in a day. The reasons for which have been enumerated in the order given by the panel. The then panel. I will not go into that. However, subsequent to that, the president issued an order that all written submissions would be in. Preliminary objections number three and four, along with the replies from the learner prosecution, were put in before the cutoff date and time. They are valid. They were presented before this trial not set. I shall leave. Um, my colleague uh, really has some points to address. Thank you. That case is on the court. I have.
just two general points in reply to my learned colleague. The first is, um, my learned colleague had um, submitted to your honours that we had misconstrued the charge and how it was framed. The manner in which my learned colleague uh, addressed the charges as having been formulated, he, he suggested that they were being formulated in the cumulative, the permissible cumulative sense. Unfortunately, when you actually look at the charges, what I am saying and what my, my learned colleagues are saying is that those particular charges are not permissible cumulative charges because they bundle three offences. That is the duplicity. We do not suggest that the duplicity of multiple counts of murder, which may support uh, a crime against humanity, would be duplicitous. We would suggest that would be the permissible cumulative charge under the heading, a crime against humanity. But what we do suggest is that bundling them with the three other offences is duplicitous, because each one of those offences, as your honours will be aware, has separate elements. And, and so we suggest, with respect, that we have not misconstrued the form that the charges are contained. The second point is that my learned colleague has referred to General Yaron as having failed to do his job. And to some extent, what was put to your honours was that that was the crime. Well, nowhere in any one of the crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes or genocide, is there a separate subheading which says failing to do your job. It is extremely important that you, you determine what it is and my friend alluded to it, there was killing, there was torture, then those are the things which you attach the particulars to, so that with fairness everybody knows the particular acts which relate to that alleged offence. Um, I would rely further on my, my colleagues, um, my, my learned colleague Mr K and my submissions that we have already put to your honour, and we hope that they will clarify completely the position that the defence amicus takes. May it please the court. Thank you for the submissions of both sides.